but let's say a very good morning to Isabel. Isabel, how are you? Good morning. Well, I've got um, a new job for us, Mike. Good. I think we have got to get into the whole bridge building business. I mean, this <laughs> 49 million, I reckon you and I, if we just sit down for the best part of a morning, um, ring a few contractors, I reckon we can undercut that by, oh, I don't know, maybe 40 million? I well, mean, I... we can... I mean, I don't understand why. I mean, almost everything. I mean, one of my favourites that they mention here is Kent County Council uh, is getting £45 million, right, to improve the flow of traffic from the UK to the EU with more border control points. And all I can think of, we don't need border control points on the way out. We need them on the way in, don't we? And that's another £45 million. What the hell's going on? I mean, these are just massive sums. It's a bit like, you know, everything used to be 100 quid, and now it's like everything's like tens of millions yeah. I don't, it's just as if people just pluck these figures out of absolutely nowhere knowing that it's the public purse and the other thing about these figures is you kind of know if the initial budget is 40 whatever million for a bridge it's gonna end up being oh i don't know probably 60 or a bit more yes Cause you know what builders are like oh there'll be all <laughs> that sort of sucking and blowing yeah. oh you know i found this you know actually the ground's a bit more rocky than we thought it was going to be so what an absolute right. racket but nothing is going to spoil my good mood that we're going to be saying goodbye to jacinda ardhern yes i mean i must we're admit we're not going to miss her are we you we're know, really those... we're really not i mean you and i were both working quite late last night and i suddenly saw this story dropping at around about midnight and i thought crikey i mean it was actually quite a surprise let's have a look at her little resignation speech and so today I'm announcing that I will not be seeking re-election and that my term as Prime Minister will conclude no later than the 7th of February. I know what this job takes and I know that I no longer have enough in the tank to do it justice. It's that simple. Well, I mean... It's quite a shocking speech. I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that there isn't anything wrong because she doesn't look very happy about the fact that she's stepping down, does she, Isabel? But I'm assuming, as Judy Hartley Brewer said, it's more to do with the fact that she knows she's not going to win, uh, perhaps, than anything else. That is the face of a lady who is trying very hard not to break down in tears. Mm. She was really struggling to keep it together there. I mean... The reality is that her policies on COVID were an absolute disaster. Um, she finally saw sense, but not before a huge amount of damage had been done. You know, she pursued this utterly insane zero COVID policy, uh, subjecting her own people to the most extraordinary repression, uh, all the while with this weird smile on her face, mm. deeply sinister, uh, and, you know, locking her own citizens out of their own country. If they happen to be in the wrong place when her policies came into force, some of them were not able to get back into their own country. Quite an extraordinary thing to do. And awful tales of people not being able to give birth with the people they loved around them. I mean, just horrible, mm. horrible stuff. Um, I'm just hoping that maybe Justin Trudeau might might be next. Yes. You know? very much of the cut from the same cloth aren't they you know these so-called nicey nicey progressives uh, whose actual agenda brought nothing but but misery mm great deal of people and we also shouldn't forget isabel because some people might be sitting here going why do we care so much about somebody in new zealand well here's why we care because an awful lot of people in this country and i count nicola sturgeon amongst them all of the kind of sage maniacs uh, all the people who thought lockdowns were brilliant looked up to this woman as if she was some kind of poster girl for the way future government should operate they did. I mean, she, she took on um, a disproportionate influence, I think. New Zealand's um, not got a huge population. It's not an enormously powerful economy. But, you know, she was a young woman in a position of immense power at a time when leaders all over the world were, frankly, in democracies or so-called democracies, were frankly abusing those levers of power. And she was a, an example of that, the ultimate example of somebody who abused the levers of power. And because she looks good and because she's a young woman and because, um, you know, the uh, progressives all like that kind of thing, she was actually disproportionately influential. Yes. And I mean, as I said to Julia just now, I was half expecting her to mention the word service, you know, sort of Megan style, 
uh, as she yeah. disappeared off the public stage, you know, because she's worn out, because she's been trying so hard to do everything for everybody else. And in reality, actually, the most chilling thing I thought she ever said was when she came out uh, and, well, two things, actually. One was when she said that you shouldn't take any notice of any information unless it's coming from the government. No other information is worth reading. No other, uh, you know, critiques of the government are worth reading. And then when she said, don't talk to your neighbours, Basically, just don't look at them. Go straight into the house. Do not have a conversation over the garden fence. Just don't talk to anyone. I mean, we should never forget this stuff, uh, and nor should we uh, forget that we had some similar attitudes here. You know, when our own then Home Secretary, Priti Patel, literally encouraged neighbours to snoop and mm. spy and report on each other yeah. to the police. No, this happened in our country within the last few years, and not only should we not forget it, we should not forgive it. It is deeply insidious. Mm. It fostered a horrible culture in which people didn't trust each other. And above all, it was totally unnecessary. It totally was. And let's look at the hangover still from all of those things that happened. I'm looking in the, uh, in the Times today about this row uh, which is continuing and ongoing about working from home. Uh, and the employees and the employers who are now working out, actually, it wasn't really a very good idea. And, you know, the idea of this blended working and, you know, let's not bother going to the office more than three days a week. It's starting and continuing to have a massive effect on the economy. Well, we know that there are real issues with productivity, um, particularly in the public sector associated with working from home. And of course, in the private sector, employers uh, who find that their employees are not delivering um, do the sensible thing and either haul them in and say, look, you've got to improve your performance or, or they just get fired. Mm. We also know that in the public sector, life doesn't work like that. You know, you still bring in your salary, whether or not you're underperforming. And if you're in the civil service and you screw things up, you accidentally overlook to sign something and it costs a taxpayer multi-millions, you just get moved sideways or sent on another, you know, unconscious bias course or something like that. Right. So I, I actually think a bit of working from home, you know, a culture in which people can work from home on a Friday or whatever, is a good thing you know perhaps that's an advance uh, of the way that we um, we live and work and a better balance but it shouldn't be the default position um, for things like HMRC and it shouldn't be a reason why when you ring up these organizations publicly funded you hear you know because of the current circumstances things are taking longer there are no current circumstances guys mm. get a grip yeah exactly right and there is no excuse for things being less efficient simply because people are not working in an office if you think it's the same then fine but it isn't it's quite clear that it isn't and everybody that has any kind of uh, interaction with any company where you're dealing with people who are not in an office knows that that's the truth